Good evening, everybody. Um, calling to order the town council meeting for December 19th. Thank you. And with that, um, we'll do the pledge of allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Council Baybun. Present. Council Johnson. Here. Council Foley. Here. Council Katarina. Here. Council Dunnigan. Here. Council Hamill. Here. Chairman Hayes. Here. Good evening, everybody. And if, if there's no objections, I'd like to go a little bit about of order. We do have a guest here tonight to present us with some some things. So with that, if no objects, I'll ask Dan to, Dan Clever come up and join us at the podium and share with us what he'd like to share. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Glover. I live in Westbrook and a member of the Archangel Committee of Greater Portland. The Archangel Committee, on behalf of the Bridges of Friendship Exhibit Exchange, presents to the town of Scarborough with this patron certificate and plate to commemorate the 30 years of sisterhood with the city of Archangel Russia. This, the, if the certificate reads in part, this Bridges of Friendship Photography Exhibition launched at the Stonewall Gallery, Yarmouth, Maine, shows images from both sides of the sister city relationship between Archangel Russia and Greater Portland, Maine. This patron's plate edition is presented to each patron who made possible this effort to show how much we have in common, encourage our stronger relations, and works to bring peace to our world. Each certificate and plate have the American and Russian flag, the logos of each club, and a copy of the photos Royal River Winter Light by Dennis Marat, which is the Royal River where the, the, um, uh, where, where the exposition, where, where the exhibition is on display right now. And uh, Between Bridges, which was a photograph done by a Russian, which shows a picture between bridges, and it's the Bridges of Friendship Exchange, so we picked that to promote the, uh, promote the exchange. The patron's plates are numbered 1 of 30 through 30 of 30. The, the number 30 represents the 30 years of relationship, the 30 photos from each side of the Bridges of Friendship exhibition, and the 30 patrons of the exhibit. Each patron's certificate has an American and a Russian print that, that the patron is linked with. The Scarborough patron plate is plate number 6 and includes the photos after winter storm Skylar by Michael Newman, an American, and After the Blizzard by Alexei Kalugin. All 15 communities that are in the sister city relationship trimmed the border of this plate. Thank you. And um, we also were given a ship's wheel clock to start in Gorham for one month and will stay with various towns through the course of the year. It's a ship's wheel clock and it was presented to the Archangel Committee, so we want to share it with the, all the various communities. We are also selling copies of that play for $75 to help support the organization. The schedule of, for the Bridges of Friendship exhibition is Brunswick, Maine, January and February, Westbrook it will be there in March, and Wyndham, April and May, and we're working to continue that schedule. Westbrook High School, school Westbrook School Committee just voted on a a possible exchange in 19 and or 20 uh, of high school students. And so we encourage any high school possibilities to get in touch with us. And if anyone watched 207 li last night on TV, it was a very nice uh, program about the exhibition. And if you want to go on and line and find it, uh, it was very extremely well done. And if you need any updates on this, you would go to the portlandcameraclub.org and see the exhibition online. 
And finally and lastly, and this is quite unusual, I've given away a book, uh, this book, to a number of different councilmen and ladies, councilmen and women. And um, the book is called Loris, and it was translated from Russian into English by one of your constituents. Her name is Lisa Hayden, lives in Scarborough. She was our translator in 1988 when we went over in Russia. She has received international acclaim for the quality of her translation. She lives right next door to somebody here. And uh, so I was going to give it to one person. I, I, I read the book, and it, very, it took me a year to read it, but it's a very easy read, and some people can read it in a weekend. Uh, but it's it's a it's a it's a it's like a it's a lesson on life and, and how to take responsibility how to how to be responsible and and and, and to quote newly elected councilman um, I heard you say during one of your meetings last I was here that the council is not listening so I would encourage you to read this and pass it to you <laughs> and maybe. <laughs> well, I'll learn. Well, that's, it's, it's an Thanks extra, very much. It's an <laughs> Thank you. Lisa, I highly recommend it. I, I think it should just pass down this way so that maybe it never gets to the <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you. you very much. So, no, thank, thank you. you. So, thank and you. we will um, <laughs> we will find a place to display what you've given to us. Uh, we, I talked to Tody, and we will find a way to get it on display. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for joining us, and happy holidays. Thank you too. Merry Christmas. Um, with that, the next item on the agenda <laughs> is order number 18084, act on the request for an executive session pursuant to Title 36 of the MRSA 384-2 for the purpose of deliberating a hardship poverty tax payment case, number 201901. With that, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye.
People moved on this side of the table, and they finally moved to the front. <laughs> well, good evening. I, I think tonight the purpose of this workshop was really to try to get together. We have some, some issues that are coming forward in front of us about land use and some questions around what are our policies around, around land use, how do we do zoning, what are our thoughts around amendments that we make in contract zones. So with that, I know Tom and Jay have prepared some materials for us. And I know there's lots of material there. We all got it ahead of time, which is great. Uh, but I don't know if you guys wanted to take us through some highlights and then kind of open it up to Yeah, we'd like to move fairly quickly through. We did provide a copy of this. It's in a PowerPoint, but it's very dense. And by its almost definition, zoning is, is fairly dry and dense uh, itself. Uh, so we don't intend to read this word for word. It was yeah. intended as background material. Mm -hmm. And as Chairman Hayes had mentioned, we think it's important to provide some basic context about kind of land use in Maine and, and what is zoning and, and, and the like, and then move, uh, as part of that discussion, move into more specifically contract zoning, what purpose that serves and kind of the local process that we've adopted for it. And even the, uh, the examples historically of the contract zones that exist today, uh, just again, to provide some context. So with that, uh, I've asked Jay just to kind of uh, give us a quick overview and highlight, work fairly quickly through it, and we think it would be helpful to get into a conversation after that. Yeah, so one of the questions that was sort of asked are, you know, how are land use regulations uh, devised in town? What's the, both the process and sort of what, what are the considerations that go into making these decisions? So i um, really just going to start by talking about our, our zoning ordinance. Um, and, you know, just briefly, you know, all towns have by home rule the rights to write their own authority to adopt local land use ordinance and that's really where our zoning ordinance comes from is state statute allowance um, and the process to amend our zoning ordinance um, which I'm sure council is pretty familiar with is starts with a council first reading proceeds to a planning board public hearing um, at which time the plan board provides an, an opinion or advisory opinion to council comes back to council for a public hearing and then ultimately is approved by council as second reading. Um, we'll just sort of mention that um, sort of most ordinance changes amendments, and this includes the adoption of new zones, new zoning districts, um, we, where we have an existing zoning ordinance. We're never really creating new, uh, a new zoning ordinance. We're sort of embedding amendments to it, so to speak. So this is the process we follow, and, and most of those amendments are generated from, have been, at least in the last 10 years or more that I've been here, generated from our lo uh, long-range uh, planning committee, really following the guideline of the comprehensive plan, and they go through their own sort of public uh, process before it even comes to council, um, and that takes different shapes depending on, on um, the, where we're working. Uh, other other items will also come through the ordinance committee, which is obviously a subcommittee of council. Um, so I think that's really where most of those amendments are generated out of. And just the, the uh, kind of the balance that needs to be achieved in land use is the balance between property rights, what someone can do on their property, and individual rights. And that can be tricky, for sure. And, uh, uh, you know, we have a, a zoning ordinance, Chapter 4 or 5, which is 500 pages or some such thing. And, 20 some odd zones in town, so it, it can get very complicated in finding that balance. And, and in terms of sort of what are the criteria that, you know, maybe council or, or committees look to when thinking about new land use ordinances or, or amending the land use ordinance, it's really about finding consistency with the comprehensive plan and that it's in the general public, uh, you know, looking out for the safety and welfare and general public good of the community. Those are sort of the, the threshold, so to speak. Um, 
and I, you know, just in the presentation or in the documents provide you the zoning, the purpose statement from the zoning ordinance so you can sort of get a, a sense of those things. Um, so that's really all I had on the zoning ordinance per se, and, and then I, was, uh, I know some of the interest also was around contract zoning. So, um, you know, I thought it would be helpful just to sort of step back and what is contract zoning, and, you know, obviously I have some quotes up there, but really it's, it's, a, it's an ability, it's a, an agreement between a property owner who wants to do something that may be outside the purview of the zoning ordinance, um, and it's a, they come to an agreement with the town council as the legislative body of the uh, town um, as to um, sort of depending on certain conditions that are set forth in that contract zone, and the council is really guided by, again, the comprehensive plan as well as sort of the public benefit factor. And it, 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 in the ordinance it says that's really determined by the council at its sole discretion. Um, and so it's just helpful, I think, to, to keep in mind that, you know, contract zoning is a, it's a, it is a legal land use tool that has been enabled by state statute and adopted by council. It's actually been on the town's books since uh, back to 1990. Um, it was substantively rewritten, I think it was, in 2001. Um, and so, again, I sort of lifted some of the language from our, our zoning ordinance that talks about the public benefit. I think this next slide, <laughs> these, these are the, I think it's, I counted, there's 16 or 18 sort of uh, bullet points about which the council is to consider when thinking about public benefit. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily need to say it needs to hit all of these, but it, you know, which, which of these are, constitute that public benefit when thinking about that contract zone agreement when you're, when you're having a discussion with um, an applicant. Um, <clears throat> so uh, coming, sort of getting away from what contract zoning is to now the process of how do we go about adopting and amending contract zones? Uh, first, we, the adoption process starts with, and this is spelled out in the zone, zoning ordinance, starts with a joint hearing uh, between the council and the planning board. Um, and that's actually a, uh, a, a public hearing as, as required by state statute, and that's notified, um, and abutters are, are, are given notice of that. And essentially that, that serves as council first reading, but it's Again, the planning board's at the table, and I think we had one of these not too long ago on the Acura dealership, I believe it was, mm -hmm. which is our a new contract zone where planning board sort of provides their input as to the land use implications and such before council has their uh, discussion. Just important to know, with contract zones, they always, in, in every case, start with a property owner requesting it, and they actually have to file a fee, presumably to cover staff costs. Uh, I don't believe it does cover all those costs, but nonetheless, unlike zoning ordinances often emanate from staff or from internal, <coughs> sometimes there's out, outside influence, but in all cases, zoning uh, contract zones start from the property owner saying, I want to do something on my property and I can't. Once, once and if council at that first joint uh, hearing with planning board finds that the application should move forward, it moves towards uh, Planning Board. Planning Board does their preliminary site plan and or subdivision review. They've sort of taken it to, you know, 80% or 90% of the way there, you know, they had a general understanding and direction where it's going, and they also, at that time, do provide, um, are able to provide recommendations to council if there's anything in the contract zone they think might want to be looked at, but again, it, it boils down to council action at your discretion, so it does come back to council who holds a... Um, uh, public hearing and second reading. Um, actually, uh, you even hold a, a first reading on the item. I'm uh, sorry. And then you hold a public hearing and a second reading. Second reading is when a vote happens. And these are uh, um, taken at separate meetings uh, individually. That process is prescribed by council rules in terms of adoption of uh, an ordinance, which is this is. Mm -hmm. And then once council, assuming council approves the contract zone, it goes back to planning board for sort of final approval because at that time, now the zoning has been changed. The zoning for that property is that agreement and now the planning board can take their final action with the proper zoning in place. Um, Jay, Jay, can I ask a question here? Yeah. So I know there's a step before uh, the hearing step, right? Is that the one where there's the first council review and say it's okay to go to a hearing? Yep. Can you recall uh, um, of all the 
contract zones that we've had, I guess there were 11 or something like that, or was there, was there ever one denied at that first step? So uh, I'll get to that a little bit later, but yes, and actually there's a recent case of yeah. that. Um, Just in, in, in my 11 years, that's the only one I was aware of. I think, mm -hmm. think uh, I'll have to look back at the slide, but, um, but yes, it could be denied right at that step. Um, that happened within the last six months, I'd say. Yeah, that was right before the Yep. Thanks. Um, so then the, the zoning also uh, establishes a process to amend a contract zone. Somewhat similar, however, the one thing it does is it moves the public hearing really to that second step, the, the formal public hearing in the process, if you will, to that preliminary uh, planning board review process. The first step is uh, joint ca uh, council by itself doing a first reading. Um, and so that's not the joint meeting with, with the planning board, and that's really the main difference. And then it goes to, as I was saying, first reading with council, then to planning board, the statutory public hearing, then back to town council for, for our rules, public hearing, and second reading. Following uh, approval at second reading, it goes back to planning board for final approval. These process things that Jay's just reviewing, I believe, were really the substantive changes uh, back in 2001 when it was mm -hmm. redone. Uh, and it's worth noting there was a moratorium actually imposed in late 99, 2000, mm -hmm. uh, to I think for the town to uh, catch their breath and, and work up some reasonable additional rigors of the process. Uh, and that was just on the heels of uh, Piper Shore's original contract zone, which uh, predated me, but I understand was uh, yes, it quite was. challenging. So. Councilor Babine lived through that. <coughs> Um, and so again, I think I've already said this, but really the, you know, uh, through the contract zone process, what the council is really to consider is primarily consistency with the comp plan and uh, the public benefit issues. So, um, and so here are our contract zones. There have been 11 that have been approved, uh, two of which have been repealed one of them by referendum and one of them by council action. We can talk about those in a little bit. Um, but then here you can see our all 11 contract zones, sort of uh, hopefully the projects are, are fairly uh, obvious to most. Some might be a little bit obscure now the way, but I'm happy to talk through them. And I have a slide that sort of, I have slides for all of them that I'm happy to work through or, um, I think at the end I sort of go through, um, would you like me to go through each one or I, the information, this is, this is the information I sort of want to get to. So as I said, there, uh, there have been two that have been repealed. One was by referendum, one by uh, council action. Um, to, to the question um, where there has been one denied, um, that was done this year, and um, that happened at the joint public reading. That was the only one in the last 10 years. I didn't do, um, wasn't able to go through all the last 30 years of history, but in my time here. Was um, the, uh, do you remember? Um, do you remember, Jim Marie? What? No. Um, well, there is another one I think that got um, denied, and that was the original when it was People's Heritage Bank. Wanted to come in at the top of I wasn't in, I guess, Parkway. You weren't in town? I was in town, but I. Oh, okay. Hmm. Anyway, what was the, what's number four? Number zone. four, contract zone repeal. Oh, so that was a contract zone that was down off the Holly Street area in town, and it was actually a, um, a single-family home back there um, that was, okay. I think, in the industrial district, yeah. and then okay. through the 2006 updates, it went into a residential zone to become conforming because that's really what it was. Um, then there have been two withdrawn within the last 10 years. Um, those were at uh, various different stages of the process. Um, and then, of course, we have two pending requests, one which is an amendment of Piper Shores, and one is a, a, a new contract zone for the Acura Automobile Dealership. Um, so that's... The information that, that I was had and yeah, have to no, answer questions. So, so again, I think the intent of just bringing it forward tonight is just so we can all get up to speed. If anybody has any questions about how we do it, how we've set zones, how we've thought about changes, anybody have any questions? For I have one. So <laughs> um, of all the 16 bullets, um, the one that interests me the most is the litmus test for the significant public benefit. 
So when you think about certain zones, you, you kind of have to struggle to determine what is the significant public benefit. How do we determine that? What is the, what is the actual test that we use in the recommendation or, or in determining? So these are the 16 that the board yep. is defined on. So and, and they run the gamut from having a net positive, and I'm sort of going to glean some words here, but having a net positive effect on the town's tax base. Uh, some have to do with providing uh, recreation uh, and conservation areas. Some have to do with providing housing type and housing choice, affordable housing, or, or very. So it doesn't say that the planning, uh, I'm sorry, I'm so used to dealing yeah. with the planning board, that yeah. council needs to uh, find on each one of these yeah. 16 or so that you, really you can pick, you can say, okay, this project is meeting this one of the public benefit. And, and oftentimes they might meet three or four or five. Um, but it doesn't say that it needs to meet a majority of these or three of these. It's at the sole discretion of council. Have they met okay. any one of these? And so as you might expect, there's been, I don't say inconsistency, just as council yeah. changes well, that's and, why and those sorts of things. And I think the other thing we've noticed in our research and going forward, I think we need to do a better job. Some contract zones have been very clear and actually have cited specific right. yeah. chapter and verse. Other ones have been a little more loose uh, around this whole notion of public benefit. So. I think going forward, we ought to be very clear and articulate right. um, and be mindful of this list right here. And I think on that point, Tom, I, you know, mm -hmm. the, I was going through the contract zones. That was one of the questions mm -hmm. was, what has been the public benefit and the consistency with the comp plan? So really, I was, uh, went through each contract zone. Um, and so you'll sort of see as we, where, where are those things? They're the other way. <laughs> I tried to sort of enumerate at the bottom there, stated consistency oh, yeah. with comp plan and public benefit. That was what I could glean out of the contract zone language itself. I wasn't trying to sort of read into what may may or may not have been there. It was, okay, here's what was stated. And that's why I sort of said stated. Um, so some, particularly the earlier ones, just sort of seemed to say, okay, found it consistent with the comp plan and moved on. Some others have said, you know, the public benefit is access to recreational trails. And so. And this specific one was essentially, it was permitted in the original zoning district that Lucinda's was in, is that correct? So mm -hmm. Lucinda's yeah. was a, is actually a home occupation, right. and they yeah. wanted to expand, so expand. it wasn't allowed within yeah. in the yeah. zone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but by scope, it was very limited, it was a single right. lot, single yeah. use, right. yeah. fairly rural, um, really hard to meet any of yeah, these. Sure. Um, so that's why you see a fairly broad public benefit yeah. claim. So was there any standard or guideline in terms of any number of the 16, how many of the 16, how, how thorough sole the Sole discretion of the council. So, so, I mean, when you, when you read the language, it, it, it's, so it's okay. pretty, it, it really does sort of say, okay, you know, meet the public benefit standard as, you know, found in appendix, I think that's appendix a. B, maybe it's A, <laughs> and at the sole discretion yeah. of council. At, so, yeah, there's not, it should meet not three, it, it should meet four, course. it should meet six. <laughs> of, of the 11, and this may be in here, so forgive me if it's yeah. redundant, but um, of the 11, how many were directly from the, they already owned the property, and how many were add-ons? Do you know what I mean? So they want to do something different from what was allotted, and in order to uh, move forward with the purchase of a property. What would be that? So I think... But that wouldn't necessarily. So my my understanding of it, um, in, in those Lucinda's days, Lucinda's Spa number two was an existing home occupation, and they want to change sort of from a home occupation to a grander use. So they already own the property. I think that's your question. That is my question. Uh, Hillcrest, my understanding is there was already some manufactured uh, mm -hmm. uh, homes in yeah. there, and they want to expand what that was. So it incorporated more properties and allowed it. So yeah. I, I guess. That wasn't an existing use, but it, it got expanded upon too. the type of homes change yeah, as well. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yep, manufactured. Well, if I'm hearing Caterer, I think you're asking yeah. specifically changing it for the purpose of selling the property. Correct. Yes. So how many up here were? Or adding to an existing. A different parcel that was Correct. Added. Right. Well, I think the car dealerships, they could not be there but for this okay. allowance. So I think that yep. would fall in that category. Piper Shores, sure. it was vacant land. Essentially, there were a couple of residential properties. but. That, that use was yeah, not there sure. and was contingent on getting this approval. 
Grandin Wetland or Welt Welt sorry. That that also that's a mitigation that right. wouldn't have been able to occur uh, otherwise. New the, England expedition. Yeah, some yeah. level of uh, retail was allowed, but not to the extent. Uh, it was really a square footage issue. That's the Cabela store uh, far exceeded the allowable um, square footage of retail use there. So that is what that. Rod Turn Farm was an existing farm, and they right. they actually wanted to sort of do a lot of uh, ancillary um, uh, farm business, so have a camp, have you know employee housing. Actually, our RF zoning has largely been updated yeah. <laughs> subsequent to the zoning to to allow for a lot of the things that their contract <coughs> zone came in for. Um, so that's something that sort of happened on the heels of. Avesta Housing, that's the redevelopment of the Southgate House down in the Dunstan area. Um, so the Southgate House itself was being used for housing, but they are building a, a new, they're, they're reusing that. So part of the public benefit was sort of the preservation of historic structure, but they're also adding a brand new building and increasing the density beyond what otherwise would have been allowed. Um, so I don't know that Avesta would have done their project, but for a contract, so they wouldn't have been able to. And is there some, and maybe I'm maybe conflating two different things, but wasn't there something to do with Misha funding or something with Avesta that you have to have a special contract? I don't know. They don't have no. to have a contract zone. No, just the okay. e economics of the project, they needed a certain number of units and density. And those, so that's what I'm conflating in my head. Yeah. Okay. But, but right. the answer to Katie's question is, mm -hmm. I think it was, how many of these involved someone that had an existing parcel of land and they were just looking for some changes on that parcel? versus someone that had an existing parcel of land, acquired another parcel of land, and wanted to change. Is that in other words, Yeah, I wanted to join, conjoin those parcels. Yeah, is, so in other like, words, the current uh, As you went down situation. through these, it didn't sound like any fit that criteria. Is that, is that and, and maybe I'm still misunderstanding the question. Are you asking All right, so Fan Rover came contract? in front of us, yes. right? Yeah. Because the parcel next to them just became available, but it wasn't zoned the same way that their contract zone allowed. Sure. And they wanted to, uh, wanted us before they went forward with that purchase, they wanted us to make an amendment to their contract zone even. To include that. Right. Yeah. How many times has that happened in any of these projects or contract zones? Oh, that the contract zones were, con or a purchase and sale was contingent upon the approval of a contract zone? No, you're no, talking about expansion. Still, um, I, yes. It's, it has more to do with expansion I, than expansion necessarily. I believe, so. so obviously everyone knows about Piper Shores now. Right. That would forward. be a great example. I believe Hillcrest was yep. um, because um, yeah. they originally just had the... Pro the um, they added that back section. They went into the back right. behind Main Medical Center yeah, and they right. acquired that property or maybe they already owned it and then they can join the two together. Yeah. Mercedes I guess Benz. the sequence of Mercedes. that is what I'm kind of interested in. And Mercedes. And Mercedes. Mercedes. Yeah. So the sequence of that is what I'm getting right. at. Yeah. Did they buy the land first and then mm -hmm. add, you know what I mean, or did they... I can tell you that Mercedes bought Mercedes. it after because they bought the Sunoco station. After, right. Right. So right. That was one of the subsequent uh, amendments to right. yeah. Mercedes. Okay. That was the, there the same with Land Rover. The 18 amendment was right. the assuming Yeah, you said car dealers. I figured it was three to four. Yeah. Maybe. Another question for you, Jay. Kind of on a lot of, just going back to the original zoning, how original zoning mm -hmm. got set and changing sort of zoning. You said a lot of it's informed by public input and consistency with the comprehensive plan. So my specific question is, we have undertaken this comprehensive plan review mm -hmm. and analysis. Have Has anything come up around changing zoning in Scarborough in any areas from either the residents or public comment? Has that been an issue where there are areas that people are asking for to be considered? It sounds like that's a critical criteria for making some changes. So has there been, in all the input you've gotten from residents and all, have there been any areas that people are looking for changes? I don't think we've heard um, that the future land use plan from the 2006 plan, which is really what the 18 plan carries forward, has been, is inconsistent or we're looking for um, significant changes. There, you know, with each sort of uh, uh, neighborhood review and update that the, um, that the Long Range Planning Committee has done, you know, the, the boundaries may change slightly based on, you know, once you dive into the details of a specific area, um, mm -hmm. that that's bound to happen. I haven't sort of heard large swaths of area um, to to sort of say, you know, uh, areas that were in are in our growth zone should be taken mm -hmm. out and put in our low growth zones or 
areas that are in our low growth zone should be put into our growth zones. Um, I, but maybe um, you know, one of the suggestions that's being uh, talked about is adding language um, to sort of try to identify some of the residential neighborhoods that might be um, uh, have general nonconformities. Say they're all half acre lots, but they're in zoning that requires two acre lots. Maybe is it you know is there an opportunity to sort of right size the zoning in, in certain neighborhoods that wouldn't ostensibly change the character of the neighborhood because everything's already of that size, um, and so that's sort of on the mar more on the margins, I would say, than a, a more of a big uh, right. it let's, change. Right, let's face it, though, we still have a lot more land to develop. Um, we've developed a fair amount already, and so those land use patterns that have already evolved, it's hard, you can't reverse them, and so uh, that tends to inform what's logical for the future as well. And then, and then a second question I had just on, going back to the 16 items I didn't count, Right. Good. Um, where did you say those originated from originally? Was it the town council that established those criteria? So they're in our zoning ordinance. So they've yeah, been so adopted by, by council. They're in uh, appendix A or B. A. So, so a. Tom, a. I agree. A. it would be great a. if we did some work to try to say, on other things I've seen, trying to attach some type of score to those 16. So there's a way when we do an evaluation, there's a more sort of objective way of saying, does this, does this hit the bar or not? I know that's a stretch, but. Yeah, the, the, or, I guess I mean, my, at some least way. To, or at least to what I was thinking was at least going forward, have those things identified very specifically mm -hmm. so that future councils can look back and go, oh, this is how they evaluated, this is where they made those decisions. Because for us, it's hard to look back in time and say what public benefit piece they used if we don't have their exact measure. That should almost be I mean? a check by the ones that they satisfy, yeah. just so we know. So yeah, I, I, thoughts, I think it's terrific. Tonight. We've articulated this. This, this right. really starts to kind of uh, establish values and priorities. Um, I think if you look at the range of contract zones, just the, all those uses, we can't possibly predict what's going to come next. And so at keeping flexibility for yourselves that you know something when you like it and when it can be massaged to be workable, I think is always something I would recommend. And the processes that we have in place intend to invite the public, and you're going to be barraged with all sorts of input, and that input is going to help inform your final decision. But, so but it's a combination of all these pieces that get you to a workable solution. But at going forward, a continuing <coughs> litigious sort of atmosphere, it would be great if we could just somehow point to what are what are the ones that we thought the projects ticked off. So it, it just, it's I think a, you're I right. Think that's we ought to call them out and specifically. Absolutely. That's uh, recite saying. them in each approval. Yep. Yeah. So instead yeah. of just some consistent. might have two, some might have twelve. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. I think that's yep. that's I mean, I think these sixteen are just hopefully a sixteen <laughs> examples <laughs> of ways in which you can observe public benefit, but the test itself just appears to be a relatively qualitative test of balancing between what. What benefits, public benefits, name any of the 16 that you might think are applicable to a specific situation, uh, and you weigh those depending on if it's a rural <clears throat> nail thing, and that's really how much public benefit do you need in that case. It didn't sound like there was a lot yet. There was nothing on the other side, the countervailing side of public detriment. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that, that that's what we, if, it, if there's a materially, <coughs> material adverse impact on a neighborhood from a proposed contract zone, then you'd have to have very substantial public benefit. Right. And that's really, I think, the, the, the to me, that's where I'm having seen and learned that we've got this in the, that's great to have that, because that's a great laundry list of things you can point to. But the test itself, so I think it was a question asked earlier, seems to me, okay, you can identify public benefits, but they really have to materially outweigh public detriment. Right. And remember, right. there is no inherent property right. Just because someone says, I'd like to do this, oh, does right. not, you're not obligated to say, we agree. And, uh, hey, you, have to, you need special circumstances because it is out of the ordinary. Well, I, but I think the legal standard, you don't need to articulate your reasons. You can say no. I mean, that's what's <laughs> unique about this.
I, I think it would be helpful if you could articulate why you don't you oppose it, but I, I don't think there's any legal standard that says you have to. To uh, Councillor Donovan's point, there, there's no mention of detriments up here, so I think that's I think that's part of a little bit of the friction when we're discussing it. Is uh, obviously these 16 we can pick and choose. I agree, it could be one, it could be five, what have you. Um, but it doesn't necessarily acknowledge that, okay, how do we weigh the cost versus the benefit necessarily? Yeah, right? I, went be, I was going to, that is just a list of various factors you can look at and say, sure. that's a public benefit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but when you're I mean Disney World would, Disney World would check all these boxes. When, you, know when you're judging <laughs> whether it's granted or not, I think you're saying, well, it's got to have something yeah. up there on the list, and then it has to be weighed in relative terms against what the sure. consequence, right. the adverse consequence. The other thing you can look at is think of it in the, in the but for context. I wouldn't want this use here but for all these sorts of mitigations or extra things you're going to do to help um, make it acceptable to whatever those are and those will be unique to the project. Uh, and and mm -hmm. you'll only know when you get to the end whether there's enough mitigation that makes it acceptable. In process it can be cumbersome. Sorry to Dominic. Can somebody educate me on why um, I, why Holly Street was no no okay <laughs> <laughs> um, done. <laughs> yeah, he said it was good to say no. Yeah. <laughs> As a process check, does anybody in the audience wish to make any public comments, or is everybody got one hand? Else? The answer really is no. Well, no. <laughs> Two. Okay. Um, Anybody else have any no, questions? Actually, so we, can tr we can try to answer his question. I <laughs> yeah. No, I'm looking at all. Sean said no, and I understand. <laughs> and I just accepted it. <laughs> well, Holly Street is just a unique yeah. kind of industrial area. Right, yeah, no, I'm familiar with it. You are. I, yeah, I'm just curious on just the thought process of where the no came about or what a counselor might have. No, you actually, when, we changed the zoning such that it wasn't necessary anymore. We allow it. Gotcha. It's permitted. All right, fair enough. There was no longer a nonconforming. Gotcha. It now became a permitted use, so now the contract zone was no longer needed. Gotcha. Yeah. So, anybody else have any other questions? Tom or Jay? So, with that, if somebody would like to ask questions about it, just sit right here. Can you actually take oh, yeah, you go up to the Thanks. Thank you very much. <coughs> Name and very brief. Tim Yeomans, uh, 10 Newcomb Ridge Road. Um, I was talking about slides 7, 8, and 9. Specifically, I'll link to a few other slides. Uh, slides 7 and 8 talk about adopting a uh, contract zone. Uh, slide 7 and slide 8 is about amending a contract zone. Um, I, I would note that. Uh, on slide seven, the process to adopt a contract zone, the word adopt or a new zone, that wording doesn't actually occur in the, the ordinance at all. Um, so one could say that, that the process for a new zone actually applies to the change process as well. I just think this is something that needs to be cleaned up and is confusing because the difference between a change to a contract zone and a new zone is very significant in that a new zone, as it's been in practice, uh, has public comment first, and I think that's really important. For example, you know, the, the, I would think the town council should set the bar high on what is a change and what is a new <coughs> request. Um, for example, a, a brand new parcel in a different contract zone probably should be treated as a new, um, a new application with prior public comment. And I think. Uh, I'd like to go on that and connect it to slide nine and this whole idea of public benefit. Um, yes, uh, this slide nine talks about the authorization, the authority that the council has to decide on contract zoning. Um, and it is indeed, it exercises its sole and exclusive judgment as the legis legislative body of the town of Scarborough. However, that authority is limited and constrained by the last clause. And the town council in its sole authority and judgment can decide on these public benefits, can decide on uh, reasonable uses, but which remain consistent with the town of Scarborough comprehensive plan uh, and compatible with the existing and permitted uses within the existing, zone, uh, existing zoning district classification. I think the word uh, but is critical. I think it provides a constraint on the judgment that the town will exercise when evaluating public benefit and reasonable uses. This is important getting back to slide seven and eight. 
when you're thinking about is something a change or is something uh, a new application, um, this, it really would help the planning board, in my opinion, if this public comment came first. Because I've seen the planning board be very perplexed on this issue without having the public comment regarding consistency with a comprehensive plan and existing and permitted uses, which are required uh, without having that first. The planning board would really help them in their review. The last minor point I'd like to make is that um, looking at zones three and contract zones three and nine of the 11, uh, there, every slide of that itemizes the contract zones, talks about stated consistency with a comprehensive plan and public benefit. Those two zones have the last bullet, which says something to the effect of contribution to affordable housing initiative fund. Um, I would refer the council back to slide three, three at a later date and looking at the purpose of zoning because there is no purpose of zoning to use zoning as a fundraising vehicle. And to me, uh, to have zoning uh, changes in exchange for fees kind of smacks of transactionalism uh, and you know, a price for changing zones, which is not really what our comprehensive plan is about. Our comprehensive plan is about principles-based uh, growth for the town uh, that is for the well-being of the citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bob Dulac and I live on 6 Newcomb Ridge. I thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I understand this is about process and we weren't going to get involved in actual projects, and, but that's my only experience that I can get involved in. And that would be the, the Dorado Piper Shores project. Um, I just want to give you a series of timelines. We just we felt like we weren't involved in the process in regards to um, speaking publicly. The process appears to support the zoning with little to no regard for the residents of this town. We have been here for 12 years, assuming that the town would not allow big development in our front yard and to accommodate low impact tax revenue. So a little bit of a time frame here that we, we that I sort of established. On July 5th, 2017, Piper Shore signed a purchase and sale agreement with the McDonald's. The document includes a 24-month deadline to reach all necessary terms, including approval zoning changes to complete the project to close the deal. I suspect the town was involved in this project prior to that signing. On June of 2008, sometime in June, it is our understanding that Piper Shores held a meeting at Camp Ketchup. The purpose, of, the purpose is to present that project to the abutters. Newcomb Ridge was never included for reasons unknown. It may have been an honest mistake. I suspect it was. On June 20th of 2008, the first reading of the Piper Shores project to the town council presentations from the Piper Shores, uh, not one discussion from, not a lot of discussion from the members regarding RF zone. The chairperson at that time had a brief discussion about his attendance at the Piper Shore presentation, which was in his mind attended by all of Butters. Keeping in mind, nobody from Newcomb Ridge was invited to that Piper Shores open house. The Acorn Lane residents did get an invitation, the chairperson informed the entire town council, and I quote this, and this is important uh, based on everything we're talking about tonight. The subdivision that runs astride from the proposed development seems to be on board with it. I think that it's very important because we are placing a higher density than the current zoning allows. After that presentation, the board, after that presentation and board discussion, public comment was allowed, but at that point we have no idea that this is about to take place because we don't have a public, we haven't had a public notice that this is this is where we're at, other than if we go to the, the, the website and take a look. Hence, no public comment from the people at Newman Ridge. The following week, the Scarborough leader comes out and we get a quote from, from the town manager. I'm really excited about the prospects. They are far and away our biggest taxpayer, and they ask for in return from that in municipal services virtually nil. They are self-sufficient for me. This seems like such a great thing to be able to support our largest taxpayer. No regard in that article regarding an RF zone or two acre minimum. Low impact dollars, in our opinion, are clearly in play here. 
regarding the fact that we weren't included in that open house at, at uh, Camp Catcher, I reached out to Jim at Piper Shores, very nice man. Jim returned the phone call on July 5th or 6th, and he claims we were, we were in fact invited. I informed him nobody in Newcomb Ridge was invited. He claimed he would look into it. I believe Jim returned the call, phone call to me on the 9th and suggested that maybe the town did not give him the names and addresses of the people on Newcomb Ridge. I believe he sent back off on that. Somewhere along the line, we just got misplaced. We did meet with Jim and Brooke on July 10th at my house at 6 Newcomb Ridge with all the butters here at, uh, on, uh, <coughs> in our neighborhood. They laid out their master plan of the Dorado property. We expressed our concerns regarding our zone. At that meeting, Jim suggested that he could, uh, <coughs> at that meeting, Jim suggested you know, he was open to some flexibility regarding setbacks. July 16th, the first planning board meeting which we attended, no public comment was allowed regarding that project. Again, we're, we're getting deep into this thing. The first, that, that, that July, the purchase sale agreement was July 5th of 2017, and we're now we're July 16th of 2018. The first planning board meeting which we attended, no, no public comment allowed regarding the project. Piper Shore schematics, uh, presents schematics to the board. Piper Shore representative, was asked why a contract zone amendment versus a new contract zone, and the reply was to the uh, was it was at the advice of the town manager and planning director to move forward in that direction. That meeting, there was a lot of buzz, a lot of discussion slash buzz talk regarding wetlands and trails. A lot of softball questions. Uh, we don't we at Newcomb Ridge we don't we don't look poorly upon that, but again, no hard questions. I do not recall any discussion about RF zone or the abutters as a concern. No discussion about the two acre minimum. A lot of discussion again regarding wetlands and trails. Piper Shores at that point is proposing 48 to 52 units, but asking the, for the approval of six, 62 just in case they can build on the back section. If they're only guaranteeing us or suggesting they're going to be a 52, why are we asking for 62? I, 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 we're, we're confused. Um, on, on August 14th, the chairperson, Mr. Donovan, was kind enough to meet with my wife and I and we to discuss some of our concerns. He was open, listened to us, had some discussion. Uh, we appreciated that time. On November 5th, Newcomb Ridge sends a letter to the Scarborough Town Council and Scarborough Planning Board regarding our opposition. Via mail, the first Official notice from the town date, uh, excuse me, I'm going to back that up. On November 5th, Newcomb Ridge sends a letter to the Scarborough Town Council and the Planning Board members, and it just letters in regards, uh, in regards to our opposition. Via mail, the first official notice from the town dated November 7th, informing us of the November 19th planning board meeting regarding the data derived project. That's the first official meeting we get uh, since, the, since the July 15, 2017 sale purchase and sales agreement. November 18th, Acorn Lane submits a letter to the Scar Scarborough Town Council and planning board opposing the project as well. November 19, 2018, the second planning board meeting with public comment allowed after the presentation by Piper Shores. This is the first time the planning board had the opportunity to hear from the abutters. I think they were surprised by the abutters' disapproval of the project. What gives the town the right to remove RF zone, which we rely heavily on for our way of life and the reason we live here? If I recall, a couple of planning board members were scratching their heads as to why we were here. RF zone in place, play by the rules. In the end, and it was late, and the board chairperson suggested that the Piper Shores will need to readjust and reevaluate how we proceed. I again believe the planning board was caught off guard by the public comments, and I suspect um, there will be changes to come, for, come forth. After that meeting, Newcomb Ridge residents sent individual letters to the town council and the planning board. Newcomb Ridge, in response to the uh, yeah, in response to the November 19th planning board meeting. 
after that meeting, a few of the town council members were kind enough to meet with, with a few of us members at, the, uh, at my house at Newcomb Ridge. Uh, the conversations were constructive. And again, here we are today on December 9th with a workshop. Um, again, for us, this meeting, I, I get the impression this meeting was all about communication and how we move forward. And if you look at that entire process, we're talking a year and a half, and we've only had technically one notified public comment allowed, and that was on the 19th of November. And I think it changed the direction of that partic this particular project. Um, again, for us, it's all about RF zone and the way and, and the light that we hope to to move forward with. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I respect you. Appreciate the time. Thank you. So with anybody else, any closing questions, comments, or Council one more. I missed one before. It was the Clearview Condo Association, the one that was recently denied. That's what I was looking for. I was just looking for an example of what were the reasons why it was denied. So I misspoke when I said Holly Street. Um, but we can discuss it. Somebody can inform me later. Yeah. So. One more question, if I may. Um, <coughs> so what, what's the standard then for uh, the board to decide? Is it, is it you know, case by case, or is there uh, an obligation to refer to precedent uh, in evaluating these? The, you know, I guess I'm not the board, the planning board to decide, the or the council? Well, can, you, or? can you speak to the planning board, and maybe someone else can speak to the council's obligations? Sure. The, the planning boards, uh, once it gets through council and their first sort of <clears throat> moves it to the planning board, the planning board's job is to do a preliminary site plan and or subdivision review. Sometimes it's one and the same, um, based on the, the standards in the site plan or subdivision ordinance. That's their primary job. The ordinance does also say that the planning board at that time, if they have any comments on the contract zone, can provide those back up to the council for the council to, at their sole discretion, do it what they will. But the planning board's job is officially to give, to grant a uh, preliminary approval of the site plan or subdivision. That's, that's their primary role based on those standards. They're not, you know, they're, it's not a contract zone at that point for the mm -hmm. planning board. It's these are the, you know, buffering standards, lighting standards, architectural standards, so on and such forth, but for whatever standards council decides to amend as part of that contract zone process. And then, Tom, Tom or could somebody in the council speak to the, you know, guideline for the council? And, you know, if and when this, you know, comes before us, I mean, are we, you know, obligated to follow precedent of the 11 or so contract zones or it's, it's mm -hmm. exclusive authority it's exclusive you can deny it outright in the first time you hear it uh, the process does require a uh, formal application to the town clerk uh, it really starts with the town planner reviewing the application for completeness and then uh, assuming that it's complete it's then scheduled for your consideration and you can deny it on the spot the first time you hear it as was done with Clearview okay. thanks Tom thanks mm -hmm. unanimous so with that, I guess we'll adjourn back to the normal session. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. Very simple. Thank you. Yeah, it was.
update from the uh, legislative side of things. It's, it's uh, very brief, but I just wanted to keep you guys informed. Um, the 129th legislature was sworn in on December 5th. Uh, both Senator Millett and Senator Sanborn and all three representatives, Representative Babine, Representative McLean, and myself were seated from Scarborough. We're still awaiting our committee assignments, which are expected at any time, but will be, there will be some substantive, excuse me, substantial changes to the committee structure for the upcoming legislative session. Just wanted to outline some of that for you guys. Uh, the Labor, Commerce, Research, and Economic Development, or LCRED committee, uh, which is considered a very broad and disparate array of issues, will become two separate joint standing committees. The yeah. Innovation, Development, and Economic Advancement, and Commerce, or IDEA committee, and the Labor and Housing Committee. The IDEA Committee will take a broader, forward-looking perspective on our workforce, economic development, research and development, and, a, and higher education as it pertains to affordability and workforce readiness, tackling issues that will allow our state to thrive for years to come. The Labor and Housing Committee will focus on its work on safety standards for ensuring needs of our current workforce are met and that all Mainers will have access to safe and affordable housing. Second, the Insurance and Finance, uh, Financial Services Committee, or IFS, will now focus specifically on the many important issues surrounding private health insurance, with a goal to ensuring for Mainers and small business employers have access to affordable, high-quality health insurance. Uh, in recognition of this new perspective, the committee will now be called Health Coverage, Insurance, and Financial Services. Uh, so all of that's just kind of bureaucratic stuff. The point is we don't have our committee assignments yet, so we're still waiting for those, but um, that's, that's one of the reasons it's holding them up. Um, based on the above changes, the cloture date, and cloture is the last date that we're allowed to submit legislation for consideration during the session, the cloture date has been extended from December 21st to December 31st. So I've already submitted, uh, excuse me, I've already received requests for two bill submissions from citizens within uh, my district, but if there are any bills that either the council or citizens would like us to consider for submission, please reach out to any member of our legislative contingent as soon as possible in order to ensure we can meet the deadline. Uh, if you don't have contact information for legislators, either see me or Representative Babine, uh, or if you prefer, all of our contact information is available on the web at www.legislature.maine.gov under the House and Senate sections. Uh, finally, the, uh, the entire Scarborough legislative contingent is committed to transparency and communication with, the citizens of, with all the citizens of Scarborough. As part of that commitment, we've decided to resurrect a long-held practice of holding regular office hours here at Town Hall. We're working on best dates and times, but are leaning towards one weekday, weekend day a month. Mm -hmm. Once we've determined dates and times, we'll ask that those be added to the town calendar for proper notification. And we'd like to extend an open invitation to all elected members of the school board and town council to participate as well, should they wish. So finally, um, while I very much enjoyed my time on the town council, I am also enjoying my brief uh, evening free time. So I will not be staying for the remainder of the meeting. <laughs> but I am anxiously awaiting to hear who wins tonight's uh, bet for meeting duration. <laughs> Chris, thank you for coming. That's, that's great. Really, really appreciate you coming and sharing. That's great. Thank you. Um, with that, the next agenda item is item six, which is the minutes from the November 28th meeting. Looking for a motion for approval or discussion. So item. moved. Second. All those in favor? Um, there are no adjustments to the agenda. Items to be signed will be taken care of. Um, and then our first order of business is order number 18085. Um, it's a public hearing in action on the following applicants who have applied for renewal of their manufactured housing communities license. Um, the three names that are up for consideration are Crystal Springs Manufactured Housing Community, Crystal Springs MHP LLC, Pinecrest Manufactured Housing Community, community and Hillcrest Manufacturing Housing. Um, and I think usually we turn to Tody to give us an update or things sure. that we need to consider as we deliberate um, this issue. As I noted in the memo, um, I've spoken with the, the zoning administrator and all three communities have been inspected and it's recommended that the license be approved for all. As an update, uh, the Crystal Springs Manufactured Housing Community was recently purchased and the owners are working with the code office to oh, cool. bring things up to par. And um, both the zoning administrator and I feel that these should be approved this evening. With that, is there any public comment? 
Um, seeing no public comment, anyone want to make a motion to approve? So, so moved. Second. Um, anybody wish to discuss these items? Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you, it's unanimous. Um, next item on the agenda is order number 18086, public hearing and action on the new request for food handler's license from Peter Zinn at DBA, oh boy, how do you pronounce that? Chumi? Chumi cookies. Chumi cookies. Um, located at 5 Lincoln Avenue. And again, we'll turn to the town clerk for any updates or information. Sure, this is uh, actually an individual who is, um, had been working for Italy Pizza, and they were making the pizza dough. That company has moved out, and he's now uh, taken over that space. That's why he has the uh, request in front of you tonight, because he's going to be the sole um, business in that area. Is there anybody here that wants to make any public comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll call for a motion for approval. So, oh, so moved. Second. Um, any discussion of this item? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. It's unanimous. Um, turning to old business, we have order number 18. We have one more. Oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Yep. Order 18087, which is a public hearing action on a new request for a special amusement permit for None Such River Brewing located on 201 Gorham Road. And again, I'll turn to the town clerk for kind of an update on sure. um, uh, the request. And yeah, the um, special amusement permit, if there's a establishment that is serving alcohol um, and having entertainment, it's required by state law to have a special amusement permit. So the Nonsuch River Brewery, as I noted in the um, memo, is asking um, for a this because they're having a New Year's Eve event. Uh, they did ask for an exception or an exemption from the Good Neighbors Ordinance uh, in that if they, um, they intend to end at 12.30 a.m. So um, the Good Neighbors Ordinance would be, it would have to end at 9 p.m. because it falls on a Monday night. Um, we've had uh, two of the neighbors, and I believe I included the emails in your packet. Mm -hmm. um, the council has the option of, um, one, denying the request, or making a, um, uh, placing a caveat in that they could issue a one-time exemption for this event, but all the other events, if they were to have it, would fall under the Good Neighbors Ordinance, and they would have to be required to finish there at, um, <coughs> entertainment by 9 p.m. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, during the week they may close at 9 or 10 at nine. night, 9. So, nine. Okay. and the owner is here if there are any questions. Does the, do you want to make any public comment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Tim Boardman. I'm one of the owners at Nunsuch River Brewery. Um, this uh, amusement request is particularly for an event we're having for New Year's Eve. Um, we want to have a, basically it's an unplugged string quartet. Um, we're a family restaurant. I know for the people that have been in, the acoustics in there do not provide for any sort of loud anything. Um, <laughs> and uh, the building is such that we have four inches of spray foam insulation whole entire building. We don't have any windows that operate to open or close. So um, if if this live music were audible outside of the building, I would be shocked. It wouldn't be any louder than our normal music that we play during the evenings, um, any other normal time that we're open. Um, again, this is not going to be a plug. There's not going to be a drum set. There's no electric guitars. There's no PA system. This is a acoustical string quartet for jazz background music for our New Year's Eve. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions? I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Okay. Council Donovan? And, and I'll direct this to the chair to either the town, uh, uh, to Tony Justice or to Mr. Boardman. The request is to extend the hours of That's correct. operation, not to exempt it from any of the noise provisions of the good neighbor ordinance. Right. It's just to extend the hours to 12.30 a.m. So yeah. the, we still have no noise can be heard beyond 200 feet from the source of 
the music. Correct. So that still remains in effect. Okay, thank you. And this request is specifically just for New Year's Eve, correct? The extension, I believe. The extension yeah. is just for the New Year's <coughs> Eve okay. event, yes. So, so the, by granting this, they would be able to operate throughout the year under this license, but you'd need to comply with the requirements of the Good Neighbor Ordinance. That's correct. Uh, Councilor Hill? So I have a question, um, or just something I'd like to point out. I'm mean, reading the letters from the you know, the neighbors, they're, they're really not speaking to the music so much as they are other noises that have been problems, you know, because of late hours, uh, you know, and parking and so forth there. So, so uh, that's just something that, um, you know, did catch my eye. I mean, I, I, I understand the point about uh, this being simply a time extension, A and B, string quartet, you know, even if they have speakers, yeah, I can see how we wouldn't hear it. But, the neighbors are really complaints are are broader than that, and you know do speak to an extension, you know, uh, on a holiday evening, New Year's Eve, you know, and uh, these individuals are, uh, you know, entitled to, um, you know, their rights of privacy and peaceful enjoyment. So, uh, you know, I, what I've seen is that I think we've had a number of. Uh, amusement requests and uh, you know as time has gone by and we have more and more businesses and uh, in areas where there are, are also residences you know you know this is something that you know is of concern to me and, and I you know don't view it as just a simple uh, you know narrow exception any more specific questions question for mr. Boardman through yes. the chair yes are you only concerned about New Year's Eve and that's just the language of this permit, is that it's indefinite, or? Uh, the way I understand it is the permit allows us to have live music throughout the year, and the ex exemption for be the one-time extension specifically for New Year's Eve. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, just one other comment. You know, I've seen this happen in other places where it begins with a limited request and then a few months later or a year later it becomes something larger than that and then sooner or later, you know, it's something that has actually had an impact on the character of the neighborhood. So, you know, it, these are things that have been, uh, you know, more of an issue, I think, in the area where I live down in Pine Point than in other neighborhoods, but I am sympathetic to the issues raised by, you know, by the, the, the neighbors. Um, as Pony Clary Toady, maybe you can help. Um, this permit, this is for the one time exception for hours, but mm -hmm. the amusement piece will last. It's an annual, but it That's goes correct. to May, right? It's That's a, correct. It's, so it's really, this will this will come back in May if there are right. some of those issues that you're speaking to, if those mm -hmm. continue to be problems. That's, that's a place that we could consider it then, too. Um, if there are no further questions, oh. Um, so just a point of clarification. So are there other events planned between now and May in which you intend to have music? There's nothing planned at this point, no. Okay. So if we were, in fact, to amend it to be exclusive to New Year's Eve, that would, wouldn't change anything for them, correct? Okay. Just to, we do have one other business just for um, that we do have a requirement that their um, music and outside entertainment ceases at 8 o'clock. That's down at Higgins Beach. So we, this is not uncommon for this type of a request. Just a point of clarification. If I understood Councilor Foley's question, um, and this is a question to the town clerk, so could this uh, permit be limited to a single evening, to a single event? Well, I did ask MMA Legal, and um, they said that they could, we, the town council, could um, make uh, where it is an annual permit, they could do a one-time exemption, but the permit would still be good until May. So they could put the, that's how it's make structured. the, pardon me? Oh. That's how it's structured, right? Right, Yeah. because it's the way it's, so they could put an exemption for going past the 9 p.m. Correct. for this one event, but the permit would still be good until May. Well, I think the question Councillor Foley had was, can the permit itself be limited to one event only? That was my question. That does not extend no. beyond no. it. Okay, my understanding from legal was okay. I just wanted to get that out before. Sure. No, but I appreciate the clarification. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So with that, um, oh, I'm sorry. 
Thanks, anyone. Good evening. Sorry Good evening. for my low voices. Uh, my name is Tai Anvo. I live uh, on 205 Gorham Road on the north side of the building of the, the restaurant. Um, and my house is closest to the building than all, all others of my neighbors. So I just wanted to make sure that you carefully uh, consider the level of noise that would be coming out of the building, um, which is going to affect my uh, family. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, whatever the noise level is, I don't care. But if it does, uh, uh, if it is uh, high enough, then what measures are we going to take in order to limit that or restrict that or handle that? So thank you very much. Thank you. Move that a motion to approval of the motion. Move approval. Second. Discussion. Yes, Councilor Dong. I I think uh, Councilor uh, uh, Hamill's comment is uh, that really is that this is going to create noise. They they have to comply with the noise ordinance. It's going to be indoors and it's going to be controlled, but it's good for the neighbors to have this opportunity to bring to our attention and really to the ownership's attention that when people exit the facility, and if they're just being, you know, gregarious and uh, you're in a residential neighborhood. And so I think this is a helpful process to, because once a good owner recognizes and is mindful of that at uh, the midnight hour when people are starting to leave after a midnight event to make sure that they're monitoring and assisting their guests in, in departing without creating a ruckus in the parking lot. I think that's, that's the helpful part that I saw from tonight's discussion. Councilor Beda. Um, so I'm gonna approve the, uh, I think this is an, an in a way, a nice test because the actual permit um, expires in May. Um, they're only, at least for now, planning one exemption, <coughs> so I think that's acceptable. I do hope, um, so to the gentleman who spoke, the resident, um, the police department, I believe, does have, I don't know the te technically uh, the name for it, but they have some type of meter, and they can measure. Um, I'm a member of a social club that's right down the street that has outdoor um, music and um, I know that um, the neighbors have called and uh, they do measure and so there is a way to take care of any complaints as well literally it's not even three I want to say it's less than half a mile down the street uh, before you get to Walmart um, I do hope and would recommend um, as a good neighbor that the owners of uh, the brewery um, might have staff or how have help <coughs> out in the roadway to kind of control because you know when there is someone there people do change their behavior Mm -hmm. um, because there are other behaviors, as Councilor Hamrell said, that have been addressed that aren't even related to the music issue. Councilor Cole? Um, yeah, I, I'm, you know, leaning towards supporting this this evening. Uh, my concern is that we are starting to hear more and more of these come up as new businesses have emerged. And, you know, I, I certainly don't want to inhibit those new businesses from thriving but I also want us to be mindful of how it changes the landscape in our neighborhoods. Um, you know, it's New Year's Eve, totally, you know, uh, support, you know, the one time a year, it's a special event. Um, I, my original understanding was that it was uh, limited in scope to that. So that, I'm a little concerned, but given the May uh, kind of renewal piece, it would be a good test. And yeah, I think we should be encouraging all of the businesses who are starting to move in this direction to be Reminding their patrons, even if it's just a little sign as you exit, you know, please be mindful of the neighbors outside. Um, you know, um, I know a lot of smokers. I'm an ex-smoker, so I, you know, I get it. But, you know, smokers will go out into the parking lot and, you know, flick the butts, and, and that's not respectful. Um, so things like that need to be paid attention to. You know, my guess is that that's probably the bigger um, issue and concern is the noise that's happening in the parking lot. I don't think a string quartet's going to blow the roof off. Uh, you know. <laughs> if they do, it'd be kind of fun to hear, um, I suppose. But uh, anyway, that's that's my feelings on, on where we are. Um, but I will be mindful and careful about all of these going forward. And I apologize, but I 
just to clarify exactly what we're voting on, because I came under one impression and now I feel like I'm voting on something else. So I'm not 100% comfortable voting one way or the other right now. So if maybe Tody could just take one more second and mm -hmm. clearly outline what, what, they're, what they've applied for, how long it applies. Yes, it's a one-time event, so to speak, but it gives them permission to do this till May. So if we can just sure. lay, close with that, that would be very helpful. The only time that they've asked for an exemption to go past the 9 o'clock deadline is for New Year's Eve. All other times they have to comply, and they also have to comply with the noise requirements of the Good Neighbors Ordinance. So this is a one-time exemption for New Year's Eve. Any other events that they have throughout the year up until May, they have to comply. I think it's um, 9 o'clock during the week weekend. and 10 on the weekends. So they still have to comply with that piece as well as the noise of the good neighbors. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, and, you know, the, the idea of an exemption from a good neighbor ordinance, uh, you know, the logic of that just doesn't doesn't fit with me. Doesn't sit easily, and I, you know I I see time and again where we're kind of putting the onus on neighbors or residents to kind of raise an issue, to you know say there's a problem or wait till there's a problem or call the police if there's a problem or you know we have all these examples of things that you know you can do if a problem occurs. And I, I just think sometimes you need to decide in favor of the residents, you know, and their rights to peaceful enjoyment, you know, on a holiday evening. So, you know, you know, because of that, I'm, I'm not going to vote in favor of this. You know, we'd be back again in May. Who knows what's going to happen then? But, you know, it does have a feeling of kind of kicking the can down down the road. You know, even if you have sneakers, it's still going to make noise. So. Okay. Anyone else? With that, all those in favor? All those opposed? Yeah. This one. Thank you. Um, good conversation. Next item, now we're on to old business. Um, order number 18068, second reading on the proposed amendment to Chapter 1401 Coastal Waters and Harbor Ordinance, Article 5, Regulations Concerning Anchoring, Mooring, Security of Vessels, Section 1A, Placement of Private Moorings. Um, in with that, for an introduction, I think we have someone who probably can weave us through that. <laughs> Angela, please join us. And these are some minor adjustments that have come right. forward. This has been brought for us before us in the past, and there were some specific questions around just some of the mooring issues and where they are in length of scope and some other things. I think there's some minor adjustments. And just to orient you to the materials in your packet, uh, what was behind the order is what was passed in first reading. Uh, committees have further yeah. digested this, and we've also included an additional version with green uh, writing, which I believe represents some further recommendations that they'd like you to consider. That's correct. The, the stuff in the things in green are the some of the things we adjusted. Uh, as you may recall, the last last meeting, I had, I had some concerns about the gear and so on. Mm -hmm. That has all been corrected. Um, what is in front of you in green is, is perfectly acceptable and should work well. Um, the other adjustment that I thought we should make is um, on commercial boats. Commercial boats, when they're sold, it's just like selling a business because that's what it is. And the way it was written, we would essentially um, take them and toss them onto a waiting list, essentially putting them out of business. Mm -hmm. So I uh, made an adjustment there where commercial mooring can be transferred. Of course, they'd have to do all the applications and so on like anybody else but give that one shot so that we're not shutting a business down uh, over a simple thing like a morning but, so that that was the other the rest of it is uh, the, the gear if anyone's interested we just shortened up that scope that I was concerned about and the last thing was the committee uh, wanted to have an avenue if somebody wanted to appeal that they could go in front of the Coastal Harbors Committee and plead their case as far as the board and so on. Yeah. Is that any questions for the officer? Uh -uh. No? Thank you. Any public comment? Do that a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Um, any discussion? Okay, I have a question. 
This has to be amended. This has to be amended, correct? Okay. It depends what you what, what, what the motion pertained to. Was it the version that? Oh, I know. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> to be safe, I think you probably should offer them by way of amendment as as a package. I don't think you need to go through each each one each yeah. one separately. So I would make a motion that we accept this as amended. Second. Um, discussion. I, it, what I would say, actually, I'm the liaison to Coastal Harbors. I know the team worked on this for quite a while, and I do want to shout out to the assistant town manager, Larissa Crockett. She was invaluable in trying to hurt us all together and try okay. to get this it's organized and put in place. I'm very comfortable with it. Um, any other comments, discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Um, I wasn't done correctly. What's that? Oh. Oh. Well, I think you voted on the amendment there. Correct. You need to vote as amended. Yes. Uh, yes, that's correct. Main motion as amended. Main, main motion, motion as amended. I apologize. One more. Yep. Was amended. Now we'll vote on the main motion. Right. As one amended. more time. One more, one so, more vote. <laughs> uh, main motion as amended. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Order 18070, second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Section 6, Definitions of Affordable Housing. Um, Tom, I think this has been with us a couple times. <laughs> it has. Uh, it has. Um, anything new to add? To this, uh, believe it or not, this intends to clarify things. Uh, I know that sounds crazy, but uh, I can tell you the Housing Alliance, who has some, some uh, technical experts uh, in their own um, professional capacity um, have worked tirelessly on this language and are comfortable. I, I personally defer greatly to their opinion. Uh, there are unfortunately a few further uh, suggestions and I believe Councilor Donovan may offer them by way of amendment uh, this evening. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, these are the uh, changes highlighted in yellow in the draft that's been posted. Uh, online and has been made available to the public as a part of the agenda packet. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm referring to changes in, uh, this is Roman numeral six, definitions for uh, of uh, affordable housing, section A, Roman numeral uh, one, uh, adding metropolitan statistical area in place of MSA, and then uh, Roman numeral three, adding uh, language that states the total annual payments of principal and mortgage interest referred to in uh, A1 small i may, in the absence of other reasonable estimates, be estimated striking the words maximum sale price is to be, so it reads be estimated based on the assumed interest rate and loan term established by the U.S. Department of House, Housing and Urban Development for housing affordability limits. It, and I should say, all of these uh, changes go yes. to assist uh, both renters and um, home, home ownership in terms of how to actually execute. Uh, we've, the good news is we have developers who are actually looking and producing units, and they've been seeking guidance from the Alliance as to how do I market these, how do I assure affordability is, uh, is ascertained in the first instance and then maintained over time. So all of these are really designed to provide some tools for execution. So that was a motion to amend. I think you need an initial motion need first. Initial, initial motion yeah. first. So move. Second. <laughs> I just wanted to beat someone. <laughs> no. Move, oh, move, move the amendment. And then uh, move, uh, move <laughs> the amendment uh, as read. Mm -hmm. I'll second it. So just any discussion of where we are? That's a fault. Um, I, I will just add that I, it does feel like we've batted this around a mm. lot, and the <laughs> language keeps changing a little, um, which gets slightly confusing. But I think the additions have been much needed, and um, you know, grant great clarity to uh, questions that I've been asked for years, in terms of you know, how do you, how are you <coughs> defining this? So um, really glad that we're taking final action tonight. Yeah, anything we can do as a town to expand, elucidate, do more. 
to promote affordable housing. I'm all in favor of, and I think this language cleanup is makes it easier for the developers for sure. So, any other discussion comments? So, I guess approval for the motion as amended. No, no. 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 Vote on the amendment, amendment first. So vote on the amendment. All those in favor? And then the approval as voted as amended. As, as amended. Yep. All those in favor? Thank you. Great. Thank you. <coughs> Next order is number 18088, an act on the request pursuant to Title 36 of the MRSA. 38412 for action on hardship property tax abetment case number 201901. Um, with that um, discussion, I don't think we'll have any. All those to approve the motion? No, no, no. I mean, uh, you need the motion. Yep. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yeah. would like to move to grant an abatement of the amount of $9,012.56 pursuant to Title 36 MRSA. 8412 in the tax abatement case numbered 2019-01. Second. Discussion? Just if I could, for clarity for those in, in the audience and at home, uh, these sorts of cases by statute are done in the executive session. This council met uh, earlier this evening on the matter, and so uh, it is intentionally vague by statute. And so we really can't reveal any further details, but I just wanted to kind of put this uh, action in context. Any discussion? So, approval of the mini motion vote. Yeah. All those in favor? Great, thank you. Next item is number 1809, act to authorize the town manager to sign Documents authorize an acceptance of $750 or any portion thereof to be placed in the asset forfeiture account. Um, this money is the, is the police department's equitable share for its contribution to the investigation of criminal cases. Um, Tom, I don't know if there's, we had some materials in the packet, but just yeah, any. We, uh, Scarborough Police Department members of our department were involved in, a, uh, in an action, and as part of that, we uh, are entitled to enjoy a portion of uh, the spoils or the proceeds, I'm not sure how best to characterize that, uh, uh, regarding the matter. And this represents our portion, our provider <coughs> share. Uh, the requirement is that the legislative body uh, vote to formally accept the, those, uh, uh, those funds. Any public comment? Seeing none, uh, motion to approve? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Order 18090, act on the request to reappoint the town clerk as register of voters pursuant to Title 21-A MRSA um, at 101.2. So moved. Second. Any public comment? Seeing none, any discussion? Jean Marie? I just want to let everyone know that if I wish people understood the amount of work that goes into mm -hmm. doing elections in, in this town or any town and thank the town clerk for taking that on. I know that uh, she and Tracy Toady and Tracy are looked up to by other town clerks in the state and the Secretary of State. I know Matt really well, the Secretary of State, and he just thinks we do a fabulous job in Scarborough, so I'm pleased to see that we're going to reappoint you. Thank you. That's a Donna. On a couple of occasions, I've mentioned to the town manager that when I had questions uh, of Toady, I would sometimes get the answer between 5 and 6 a.m., <laughs> yeah. which gives you an idea of how hardworking. Town manager said she's a farm girl. <laughs> she's a farm girl. She's up with the dawn. Tomorrow's a rough day. And the cows. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, all those in favor? <laughs> Thank you. Unanimous. 
Um, order number 18091, an act on the request from the deputy tax collector for a waiver of foreclosure on the, for, uh, the following properties. To David Drive, map T003, lot 002. David Drive, map. It's all I think it's the street this one address. Yeah, yeah the fine. David Drive. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, any public comment? A background, Tom? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, annually, uh, taxes that are uh, unpaid mature after 18 months, and this year, uh, automatic foreclosure uh, occurs for those sort of past due accounts on December 28th. In this instance, uh, these properties identified and what we're seeking approval for to waive foreclosure are all manufactured homes. Uh, they happen to all exist within the Crystal Springs manufactured housing community. And essentially these are uh, not real assets to the town. In many cases, they're liabilities. Uh, they're in many cases aged and, and uh, in fairly rough shape. And we simply don't want to own them by way of foreclosure. So this action uh, waives that foreclosure uh, from happening. In fact, as Tody mentioned, this property has been recently purchased and the new owner is working diligently with current tenants, moving some of them out. Um, and so I'm hopeful that we will not have this as a reoccurring thing uh, in future years. Approval of the motion? Or I need is there a motion? motion. I need a motion. Yes. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Discussion? Um, motion uh, approval. Vote approval. All those in favor? 7 0. Um, Act 18092, act on the request from the Shellfish Commission to approve the allocations of shellfish licenses for 2019. I think I think Tim Downs might want to come up and give us some background and I thought he was here on the food handle his license. <laughs> <laughs> I know it looks like I handle a lot of food. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim Downs, 44 Jones Creek Drive, I'm chairman of the Shellfish Committee. Uh, November meeting, we voted to uh, keep the license numbers the same they were last year. Uh, there are presently two licenses over 60 year old. There are 31 licenses that are commercial. There are four that are non-resident commercial. There are 10 student licenses that are commercial, and there is um, one non-resident student that is commercial. Uh, it was a split vote. It was a 3-2 vote, but I don't detect any hard feelings about people either way on the thing. You know, it was just what we felt was right to do. So um, we just asked approval so that the numbers can go to the state, and the state can uh, approve the numbers that we that are appropriate, and if you have any questions about anything, I'll try to answer them. I got all kinds of paperwork here and stuff. <laughs> Just one question, without details, because I don't need to. Um, was the the two that were opposed? Did they want to increase them or decrease them? They wanted to increase them. Okay, that's all I had. Any public comment? No. <laughs> um, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Um, discussion. I guess I, I guess I'll, I'll pipe in. I've you know I've been the liaison to the Shellfish Commission for a while. I know there's been lots of conversations over the years about licenses and the methodology and what we do. I know you guys are thinking about how we're going to because it, it usually is very rarely is it unanimous on what you recommend and bring forth. Um, so I know you know a goal this year will be how do we how do we start looking at that. So thanks for all that you do and I'll support your the, the recommendation and. Forward. So, anybody else with any comments, questions, discussion? Um, all those vote for approval. Well, we did already. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 My father always said, "If all the votes are always unanimous, then there's something wrong." Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's got their own opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like his father. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, Order number 18093, an act on the request from the council chair for the appointments to the council standing committee, liaison appointments, standing committees. Um, I have those. Um, I suspect there's probably not public comment, but I'll open it up to public comment. Um, with, with that, I will read off the, the, the list, the appointments. Finance committee, three members, chair will be Councillor Baybine. The members will be um, Councillor Hayes and Hill. 
um, the Ordinance Committee. The Chair will be Councillor Katarina with Councillor Foley and Hamill. Rules and Policy Committee will be, Chair will be Councillor Donovan with members Councillor Foley and Johnson. Communication, communications Committee, there'll be three members. The Chair will be Councillor Johnson with Councillors Foley and Hamill. Appointments and Negotiations Committee, the Chair will be Councillor Hamill with members Councillor Hayes and Katarina. Um, Fair Housing Committee, three members. The Chair will be Councillor Donovan with Katarina, Councillors Katarina and Baybine. The Liaison Appointments, um, ADA Advisory Committee will be Councillor Foley. Cable Television Committee will be Councillor Foley. Chamber of Commerce will be Councillor Johnson. Coastal Waters and Harbor Advisory Committee will be Councillor Hayes. Community Services and Recreational um, Advisory Board will be uh, Councillor Hayes. Conservation Commission will be Councillor Foley. Eastern Trail Alliance will be Councillor Johnson. Energy Committee will be Councillor Donovan. Fire and Range Committee will be Councillor Katarina. Historic Preservation Implementation Committee will be <coughs> Councillor Katarina. Housing Alliance will be Councillor Donovan. Library Trustees will be Councillor Hayes. Long Range Planning Committee will be Councillor Katarina and the alternative will be Councillor Hamill. Pest Management Advisory Committee will be Councillor Donovan. Planning Board will be Council, Councillor Hamill. SEDCO will be Councillor Katarina. School Board will be Councillor Johnson. Senior Program Advisory Board will be Councillor Katarina. Um, Shellfish Committee will be Councillor Hayes. Transportation Committee will be Councillor Donovan. Outside committee boards will be Echo Main. Board of Directors will be Councillor Hamill. Um, JP Cog, JP Cog, I don't know how you guys pronounce that, um, will be Councillor Donovan. And the MMA Legislative Policy Committee will be Councillor Katarina. Um, that's sort of the listing. So, with that, motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those okay. discussion? Just one question. Councilor Donovan, there was a um, when you were chairman, there was an outside um, group um, for something like uh, uh, cooperative partners or uh, communities or something. The that, Metro Coalition. What is it called? The Metro Coalition. The Metro Coalition. Is that something that should be listed part here as well? It's part of GP Cog. Yeah. Oh, it it's is a, part of GP. It's a oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> oh, okay. Uh, element. I didn't and, realize that. And yeah. so I'm, I agreed to take on. Chairmanship of that for a second year. Okay. So we've started our year, so I'll ride with it. Okay. We want to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> Any additional discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Unanimous? Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know it was easy. <laughs> Um, item 9 is non-action items, no items tonight. Item 10 is standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Uh, I guess I'll start with Councillor Bailey. Sure. So um, to start right out of the bag as Chair of Finance, did want to mention that um, we will be moving those meetings. I cannot have those on Tuesdays or Thursdays because of my legislative obligations. Those are legislative session days um, that increasingly um, get uh, um, burdened on the schedule. So I do appreciate um, everyone's uh, cooperation um, or flexibility. Um, I've discussed that we're, we're shooting for the second Monday of the month with the first meeting being January 14th at 5.30. And I'm going to be reaching out to Tom, um, and I know Tom and Julie um, have been already starting to talk about the budget calendar. It doesn't generally um, uh, fluctuate because it's a pre it's set by charter uh, standard. And then I'll also reach out to the chair of the uh, Finance, uh, the school board's finance committee uh, to try to understand how we're going to move forward with them. And then I'm asking the other members um, of the committee on that 14th if we can be prepared to talk about what we want um, for ongoing issues uh, to address, whether it's financial statements periodically, um, including policies, um, as well as other items. Um, if you can come prepared so I can get those put into a work calendar. Um, and then we'll also review those other calendars and, and see where we can go from that from an organizational basis. Um, I'm sorry. Um, and so what I would like to do, because I'm in, in such a unique position, is also include, if it's okay with the chair, I'm at a legislative update, um, sure. being yeah, a member absolutely. of the legislature. So I did want to thank uh, Representative Chiazzo for coming in 
um, and uh, getting us um, started. It's, a, it's nice to have that representation. And I did want to reinforce that um, we're going to reinstitute <coughs> a, a legacy program that I believe it was uh, Representative Clow and Representative Lovett, um, uh, Glennis Lovett, um, who started having office hours here. It wasn't very long, but um, we, they were available, and I think that it's a nice way to communicate. Um, so we are going to work on uh, not only Chris and I being here, but um, if we can get the other delegations to kind of come in periodically as well. Would like to ask um, both um, the town council to consider, as well as the, I'm going to ask the school board, if we could get back to maybe we used to have um, joint workshops to talk mm -hmm. about issues that are pertinent to mm -hmm. the local municipalities. And I'll talk to you, Peter, about how that might work yeah. so that we can come informed and uh, um, actually have information to answer the questions that you have so that we're not in this kind of gotcha, um, you know, kind of uh, situation where we don't have that, especially being new legislators. I want to make sure I have the information for you. I um, also wanted to member, uh, mention again, Bill's closure, which is the date that we need to submit, is uh, December th um, 28th. I think that's what it was. It was the Friday, last Friday. I think that's the 28th. Um, yeah. While um, Representative Chiazzo said, please come to us with anything you have, keep in mind that we're walking into a legislature that has been challenged over eight years in legislative demand. There's an expectation that there may be, without even anything new from Chris and I, upwards of almost 3,000 bills um, going through for everything that had been uh, possibly declined in the last eight years. So we're very, very mindful of our freshman status. Um, Chris has already submitted two on a recommendation from, uh, I believe, members of our energy committee. And then I've submitted one, actually, that helps, um, already submitted one that helps uh, veterans in their qualifications for Maine State retirement. Um, generally, they recommend that in our freshman year, take on two because there's a lot of work uh, with committee work, uh, presentations, research, and things like that. So, um, but we are open. The big piece that I want to share with you from the delegation is that we truly want to present ourselves as one delegation. Um, while I may have a specific district within, um, within Scarborough, um, we're here to serve everyone. And, you know, if I know you from another part of town that's not in my district, you are always welcome to give me a call. The same thing. Chris has said the same thing. We'll make sure we involve the senators uh, where, when it's appropriate and, and needed um, as well if it's a bigger issue. Um, but please uh, keep us... Um, in the, uh, keep us um, on your list of who to call. I did want to mention I had a conversation with the manager. We're going to be working through the town's website to have a page on, on legislative information, including how to contact us and how to determine. Um, we're going to move forward um, possibly with the annual report and having even in that just a, at least a list of the legislators, something that we don't do now, to be more open and communicative um, with that part of it. Um, and I did want to mention that... Um, I don't remember if, um, when's our next meeting, in January, when's our next meeting, is it? The second. The second. So I cannot make that meeting. Um, it's actually the inauguration yeah. of our governor, and I will be up in Augusta all evening. Um, so I just want you to be aware of that, and I'm required to be there, um, um, because it is a joint session to, in order to inaugurate her. And then I did want to mention, I'm also, um, I, I'm really excited, I'm already starting to lose my voice, but... Um, I'm really excited because one of my first responsibilities is that they, I get to go on a tour of Maine from the 8th through the 11th in which we're going to west, the western counties to um, really see what their economic development outlook is and what they're kind of being faced with. And um, one of the things that I'm starting to uh, feel or see is that I have, I'm going to come into a lot of information and where I can, I'm going to try to get you guys copies of it because I think it's great information just about how we play into the whole economic scope of uh, the entire state. and. Um, some of the demographic information that they're sharing, particularly about the economy and the forecasting around that. So um, with that, um, that's all I have for committees. Council Johnson. First meeting of the communication committees at 8.15 tonight, so I'll see. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got ahead of myself a little bit for the school board liaison. I just wanted to commend um, the finance committee for the school board, uh, the superintendent and Kate Bolton. They actually have already started to actually visit individual schools and ask rank and file instructors uh, and teachers on their input in the budget process. Uh, I think that's relatively new and, and probably a little uncomfortable, um, but I did I didn't think that was a great step in the right direction. Uh, shout out to, I believe Sarah Layton was the one that initiated it at the finance committee level, um, and I think it's great for the teachers to be able to be face to face mm -hmm. to uh, talk specifically about some of their budget concerns or their ideas. And that's all I have. I have none this evening. 
Councilor Caterina? I have too many. <laughs> um, I'll start with the main municipal. We had our kickoff uh, with the beginning of the legislative session um, to decide, you know, what sort of bills are going to go in. I have a couple of things I'm looking forward to working on and we'll be harassing our local <coughs> legislative delegation about. Um, one is the restoration of main revenue, uh, uh, revenue sharing, uh, which was cut from 5%, which is what it's uh, supposed to be, down to 2%. Mm -hmm. And you are going to see that change, so we're, we will see some increase in that. Now, of course, we want to go right to the 5%, but we'll see what happens. Um, and also there are some innovative tax programs, particularly to help seniors uh, with doing paying their taxes, or like some of the situations we run into here in town. <coughs> Excuse me, so Maine Municipal will be getting behind uh, some of those um, efforts. Uh, senior advisory, we met yesterday, and their big thing is uh, two things. Um, one is they're going to try to have a community dinner in May mm -hmm. to celebrate Seniors Month uh, in May, and they're just the planning stages of that, they want it to be intergenerational, have it at one of the schools and get like school kids involved with it. Um, they've submitted our age-friendly application to AARP, which would be awesome. And um, they did give <coughs> Martins Point a plaque thanking them um, for the use of the conference room. Mm -hmm. The use of the Martins Point conference room, or whatever you want to call it, community room, saves the town $13,000 a year. In rental fees that we were paying previously for uh, senior programming. Uh, ordinance, uh, we will be meeting the third Thursday of every month at 4 o'clock. The first three meeting dates, if you want to note them, are January 17th, February 21st, and March 21st. The March 21st meeting will be at 430 just because of a scheduling conflict with the rooms. So, so it'll be at 4 o'clock uh, other than March 21st. And then I have a handout for everyone to start a long-range planning, and I'm going to preface this with a caveat that this is just an idea <laughs> that was floated. This is not concrete. It's nothing that's been decided. But um, the Scarborough Downs came before us uh, asking uh, for us as a town to, to Consider coming in line with other neighboring towns, because Saco and South Portland and Portland um, all have a process whereby light industrial businesses don't have to go through a whole planning board review per se if they're already in an area where they've received master planning, which is what is going to be happening at Scarborough Downs. So if you notice, one, two, the third, fourth paragraph down is really the important one. It just says in concept, <clears throat> Long-range planning discuss permitting framework that will give plan could give the planning board through the plan development review process upfront review and approval of design standards to ensure that they meet or exceed site plan ordinance and expectations of the zoning. And then from there, if applicants follow these standards, they would have the ability to submit, be reviewed, and approved by staff rather than having to go back and forth with the planning board. And then after the upfront extra permitting would go back to planning board level. So it's just a way to streamline and bring us more into line with uh, fellow communities. And again, it's only for uh, industrial and light industrial. So that's it. Uh, the so. pest management uh, committee met yesterday. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, it has a policy goal to manage the town's property with as little pesticide and herbicide and toxic chemicals as possible. Uh, the town manager holds the authority to grant waivers where uh, organics are not yet at a level of effectiveness uh, and the situation that's presented by grubs, uh, uh, which is the most common example, uh, uh, would seriously damage uh, fields, particularly sports fields, which are kept at a higher level than the average lawn that uh, surrounds the buildings. Um, the uh, committee is working on a report. They've been in existence now about six years, five, six years, and they are working on a report to provide to the town council so that we can actually know how are we doing. 
both from a cost point of view as well as an effectiveness point of view. So that'll be coming in 2019. Uh, that, those, that really was the focus of the meeting. Uh, it was, I really do admire this group, very dedicated and, and conscientious, and they made a point of expressing their appreciation to Todd Souza for helping them really move forward as a group. I think they've spun their wheels from time to time uh, and felt uh, a lack of guidance and direction. Todd really has terrific administrative skills and is organized and has them on task, and they uh, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not much to report in terms of uh, progress uh, according to the uh, committee assignments that were approved this evening. So I uh, have had some preliminary meetings already with, uh, with Bill Donovan and look forward to having one with Tom tomorrow to get out in front of the in particular the appointments and negotiations work ahead because there's a backload of stuff that's queuing up already uh, and a lot of it having to do with the zoning board and also planning board. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to mention uh, one thing about the uh, planning board process. I sat through, I have been sitting through on those meetings and there was one last night in which we reviewed the the master plan, uh, you know, at a high level, initial master plan for the innovation district. So. It was a really long meeting, and it's pretty clear to me that we're, uh, you know, we're we're going to be going over a lot of new ground. Um, and I, you know, I'm torn between the idea of uh, you know trying to streamline um, on the one hand versus um, making sure that we're going to be very careful and deliberative about uh, you know those areas. That one in particular is one that's been extremely important that we get right. Uh, there's a risk there that an initial uh, tenant could define that entire district, and that's a key part of the down. So that's something that I will be looking forward very much to working with uh, Councillor Katarina and, and the other folks and, uh, and Larissa on the Ordinance Committee uh, and agree that this is, uh, you know, big stuff and uh, as illustrated by the idea that, that we've heard about this concept of a streamline, mm -hmm. uh, which is a pretty well-developed idea so far already. Um, one other point I'd like to make, and, I, uh, uh, and this is related to the committee work in particular, but there uh, were a couple of key meetings this week, uh, one having to do with the communications, uh, the dialogue with the town, uh, and also one having to do with Route 1 traffic issues. Uh, and, and, and in both of those meetings, uh, there, there were comments. I didn't attend them, but I understand there were comments made to the effect that, well, we really need to have someone from the Downs here, you know, uh, representing a point of view and participating with us. So, and I realize you know, we're just breaking ground here on Route 1 on Phase phase 1. Um, and they're developers, they're builders, not primarily, uh, you know, planning to spend a lot of their time in committee meetings. But I think it's essential that we get that point across to our partners, our new partners, as of a contract that was recently executed, that we, you know, begin in full and a robust way as you know, fully engaged partners in every respect. Thank you. Um, I don't have any comments this evening. Uh, <laughs> so I think that's to the town manager. Sure. Sure. Just a, a very few things I want to touch on. Uh, I had the occasion to attend this one community, one community, many voices meeting mm -hmm. earlier this week. I know I think three members of council were there, three or four school members, and by my estimation, probably 65 to 70 residents mm -hmm. in, in all. Yeah. And I'm sure there'll be other comments. Uh, I was pleased to be part of that. Uh, I worked very hard to make sure that I kept, I was there as a citizen, not as a manager. And I think based on feedback from uh, those that I had uh, discussion with, I think I succeeded there. I really just want to acknowledge uh, the work of Janice Cohen and uh, Dana Melissa Jones. Mm -hmm. I think both ladies must have put in 100 hours to get mm -hmm. to that point uh, in terms of all the individual meetings, the coordination, mm -hmm. the sort of talent that they were able to pull together to help us that evening. Uh, and they did this because they love this community. Uh, and so that's, I just wanted to recognize their efforts. Where we go from here, I think, is up to the rest of us. And so that's uh, a big part of the, the charge going forward. Um, myself and staff stands ready to uh, uh, support committees. I think we've got a lot of things uh, ready to move forward, a lot of big, heavy issues that uh, are going to be interesting to start engaging the council and its committees and, and certainly the public in. So, we stand ready to uh, move those things forward. 
And two housekeeping matters. Uh, we are closed uh, next week, Monday and Tuesday, the 24th and 25th. Uh, the following week will just be New Year's Day, January 1st. And then looking beyond that, your next regular meeting is January 2nd. Mm -hmm. And Chairman Hayes would, I believe, and you can speak to this further, would like to have a special meeting. It would be uh, for a workshop to be held jointly with members of the planning board to talk specifically about the Piper Shores contract zone. And uh, perhaps you can talk about that further. But I just want to make sure everyone at least got that date on their calendar. Um, I would propose 6 p.m. if that's acceptable, folks, just so we can get home at a, a, a normal time. So January 9th, that's your off Wednesday, if you will, uh, at 6 p.m. With that, I'm available for questions if you have any. Anybody for questions, Tom? Anything? Um, so the, the last item on the agenda is just council member comments. This time I'll start on. Councillor Hamill's side of the table and anything else you'd like to share with us this evening? Yes, um, just that I'm ex very excited and encouraged about the work that uh, is in front of us and how uh, we are wading into it. In particular, I want to thank uh, uh, the tone that Bill Donovan and Tom, uh, Tom Hall have set for us uh, and, and the standing council, you know, uh, uh, they, they've been very welcoming and supportive and encouraging from the start, uh, and I think that that just speaks volumes, um, and it's, it's going to help us all get off to a great start. So I'm very excited uh, uh, and uh, very charged up about that. So thank you, and uh, I think that'll make uh, the load-bearing easier. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. That's it. Uh, just picking up on uh, Councilor Hammer's, uh, Hamill's comments, uh, on committee reports, the uh, uh, the planning board meeting was ours yesterday, and it was exclusively dedicated to the Scarborough Downs project. Uh, he sat through it all. I uh, forgot it was on and started to tape it uh, just at, as it was ending. So, uh, <laughs> but I did check in today to to see what the, the result was, and the result was that the Scarborough Downs second phase, uh, the uh, light industrial and commercial space, 150, 180 acres, an enormous area, had its master plan approved. So uh, it, what's exciting is uh, this thing's moving forward. We heard lots of, gee, this, they could be just all residential. Well, they, their plans, uh, they're, they're uh, acting with their feet. They're charging ahead, and it's exciting. And I can't really wait to see how, uh, how they proceed on this. Uh, I don't have any particular comments other than to wish everyone a wonderful holiday season with the holidays coming up, and uh, I'll see everyone next year. Thank you. Council Miller? Yes, I have, um, let's see, at least eight minutes of commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Just let Sean speak, you'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, no, I do have a couple of quick things, though. Um, number one, I wanted to piggyback what um, uh, Town Manager uh, Hall uh, d I talked about. I did have the opportunity to attend the community di dialogue um, on Monday evening at Camp Ketcha. Um, I thought it was fantastic. Um, it was a really diverse group of folks, um, and they very intentionally um, mixed, made us sit with people, you know, that we didn't know. Um, or, you know, so every table I could look at it and I saw diversity amongst what I, the little I know of the people in the room. So I was pleased. Um, and even with that, it, there were a lot of themes that emerged. Mm -hmm. um, and I look forward to kind of seeing their summation of that and how we as a council can kind of use that to help inform our work as well. Because I think that kind of dialogue and that kind of um, back and forth and is exactly the kind of thing that can really set us apart. We're already a great town. We want to be the best town. Um, so uh, I wanted to thank um, both Janice and Dana for their work on that. Um, I've heard a few things about January 2nd, and I just want to put out there, I am going to be on a real vacation <laughs> um, from January 2nd to the 9th. So um, Anyway, that's just we can talk about that offline, but in terms of schedule, but if that matters for p other people who have may have conflicts, 
Um, and then last but certainly not least, um, it's the holidays and as holly and jolly as they can be, um, it's always a time that I'm very uh, aware of and mindful that it's not holly and jolly for everyone. So look out for each other. Um, if you need fuel assistance, if you need anything, um, please reach out. There are resources around town. Um, and I uh, do wish everyone a, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. So I'll third. Oh, yeah. No, I'm no. just kidding. <laughs> I will uh, third Katie and Tom's comments about the community conversation and thank uh, Janice and Dana. I thought it went extremely well. Uh, more specifically, I'd actually like to thank the people. I'm not going to. I'm not going to call them out, but I'm going to thank the people that were at my table. Uh, for lack of a better term, we could call them my political rivals, uh, and um, they, they had every right to, to come at me, and they didn't. Everybody stayed very respectful, and I thought that it was, it was productive. So um, thanks to Janice, and thanks to Dana, but thanks to the people that were at my table. Thank you. Uh, just uh, three items. Uh, first is um, I want to thank the chair in particular uh, for the committee assignments and for being generous um, with my commitments um, <laughs> and meeting my needs because it's um, I'm not sure um, so the fire hose has not been fully turned on yet up at the state house but I have a feeling it's going to uh, get uh, pretty exciting here very quickly um, as uh, representative Chiazzo said I think this Friday is the date in which we're going to find out about our committees and um, just so that you know, um, I'm actually hoping to be on that new committee regarding health care insurance and financial services. Um, you know, the banker wants to be on financial services, and I'll take health care at the same time. It kills two kind of two issues at once. Um, so I'm really excited. Um, we'll see what happens with that. I, you know, ask for everything, and I hope that you get, uh, you know, what you can handle. I want to mention also, of course, happy holidays, Merry Christmas to everyone. You know, this is a time of reflection uh, for me and our family. Um, starts at Thanksgiving and kind of goes through the New Year's and you know I think that if you think back to what we have gone through not only as a community but also individually and as a council and as friends and neighbors I think it's been a very exciting year there's been challenges of course um, but with challenges comes opportunity to grow and um, I'm really excited about what 2019 is going to uh, lie ahead for us and so um, I hope everyone um, kind of thinks about that because um, there's going to be it's going to be a good year and I did, of course, I have to mention, I was going to mention it under my legislative piece, but um, I want to congratulate a Scarborough resident, Jean Lambrew, if I pronounced that correctly. Ms. Lambrew is um, being nominated by Governor-elect Janet Mills to be the next commissioner of DHHS, which is the Department of Health and Human Services. Highly qualified, an absolutely incredible resume, was originally from Cape Elizabeth, um, but she is a Scarborough resident now, so congratulations to her. Um, I think it's going to be a very exciting time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll keep my comments brief. First and foremost, happy holidays to all. Um, and I do want to kind of echo others. I was also at the community dialogue and, and two things, and, and both Dana Morris Jones and, and they've put, as Tom indicated, hundreds of hours. More importantly, they also put some money into actually renting the space that we're at and some other things. So they were really invested in this. Um, and, and uh, I will echo, it was, I, I think we've, we've it, it an interesting time. I'm really excited about the work we're going to be doing together. Um, I was really excited about the dialogue that happened that night. There were people in voices that I had not seen before engaged, and they were there and they were engaged, and we had a lot more in common than we did, and some real common themes, and we'll probably hear more about it, as Councillor Foley said, was a lot more about how do we talk to each other, how is there better two-way communication between all of us. Um, so I was really encouraged by that. Um, and I guess with that, I will leave it at that and say happy holidays and look forward to the new year. Thank you. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? On the dot. <laughs> did, you, did you get it? I'm so good at this game. <laughs> <laughs> so who won tonight? I did. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> but you took my number. It was John supposed to be mine. Yeah, they do. Yeah, well, yeah. we used to.